Hello, uh, my name is Claire Carter. I'm the infant feeding lead here at the Royal Barks Hospital in Reading. Just now we can't do our face-to-face -face feeding classes. So I thought I'd show you uh, a video of a class that we filmed in 2018, I think, and bring the class to you. There's a wealth of evidence out there that shows that breastfeeding helps to reduce the risks of infection diseases. Breast milk itself is a live milk from your body. So it contains antibodies, antivirals, various other cells that help reduce and destroy harmful pathogens. This will really help to boost your baby's immune system. So when you breastfeed your baby or express milk for your baby, keep your baby close. Offer skin to skin wherever possible, no matter how you choose to feed your baby. This is also protective for babies. Click on the links below for links to current information. So, this film is about an hour long, so I suggest you get yourself a drink and get cosy, snuggle up on the sofa and enjoy. So I'm Claire Carter, I'm the infant feeding midwife and uh, we're going to talk about feeding basically and getting to know this baby and uh, just the early first few days, what helps uh, adjusting to parenting and what helps calm you and the baby and we do talk about uh, breastfeeding, mostly most groups want to know about that. Uh, we talk about how to hold your baby, how to feed it. Uh, we talk about bottle feeding, how to hold your baby, how to feed. So the session we call it Love Me, Feed Me, Protect Me because uh, we want to talk about obviously feeding and nurturing your baby uh, and getting those parenting skills is also very useful. Pregnancy, and there's lots of things happening to your body in pregnancy, isn't there? Obviously you're growing your babies, which is the most important one. And I think women think about their own diet, maybe their exercise, how you are emotionally, it's very important. And obviously monitoring the baby's movements and your midwife will be saying to you, just know what's right for you and your baby will have a regular or irregular moving pattern. Sometimes when we sit finally at the end of the day when we're less busy ourselves, we might notice our baby kicking around or squirming. And it's very important that you monitor the baby's movements for the baby's well-being. Um, and equally, where, where I want to take that step further is about the emotional well-being and your baby's growing brain and the way the baby develops inside you. And you need to be connecting with your baby. And I'm sure you're doing this easily. So even with your busy second-time mother, take some time out, either at the beginning of the day or the end of the day or both ends of the day, and just sit a minute you don't have to exactly meditate, but just sit a minute and just, you know, centre on your, on your growing baby. And this is important for you to imagine what the baby looks like maybe and notice this, as I say, the movements. If you begin to develop a relationship with your baby in the womb, then it's so much easier to be responsive to the baby once it's born. You'll tune in to one another and uh, it's really good for you and the baby because you need your baby to learn from you and you need to learn from your baby. So one of the key things is holding the baby in close and having good eye contact with your baby. Because babies learn from us. We learn visually, don't we? And so understanding your baby's emotional needs is really important and they need to learn that from you. So if your baby is stressed at all or baby is upset, you obviously instantly go to pick your baby up and giving your baby eye can contact, smooth, so soothing your baby with stroking, kissing, murmuring, uh, the, just be, just holding and being tender with your baby. It, it, it'll help calm your baby, and it'll help calm you. Your job is to develop a, you know, understanding, communicate with your baby, so that you learn to regulate your baby's emotions. Baby's brains, social and emotional brain. This frontal part is how your baby grows, and this is the key part for you to help develop. In pregnancy, it's kind of probably tell me you're doing some of this already. Anybody talking to their baby? Singing to their baby maybe, yes? But I suspect you're all stroking your bump if it gives a kind of wriggle and a poke, yeah? Yeah, I think most people do this. I think being attentive, even if you're busy second time around mother, involve your the siblings, involve your partner, your mother. It's kind of fun, isn't it? It's preparation. You're imagining perhaps what your baby looks like. Every time you make a connection with this baby, be it in the womb and obviously when it's in your arms, 
is so important for the baby's brain to develop. Babies are born with, you know, thousands and thousands of neurons. It's like sort of, you know, a, sort of a couple of cats have been in on, you know, five different balls of wool. Give them 10 minutes, it's all scrambly around. Yeah, so all these neurons are all in your baby's head. They need to be connected and need to form pathways. So every time you soothe your baby, every time you give your baby a kiss, every time you say, ah, oh, there, there, mummy's here, papa's here, we'll be, we'll be here for you, we'll, we understand you, it's okay. Every time you talk through all the emotional stuff with your baby, click, 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 another uh, neurons connect up. So you're strengthening your baby for life. And I think sometimes parents worry about this. Oh, it's a rod for your own back, you keep picking the baby up. Dare I say it, sometimes grandmothers say this sort of thing. But your baby has needs. It doesn't have wants. It doesn't have the uh, brain power to manipulate you at this stage. Maybe at the time they get to three or four, I cannot remember, you know, they can play one parent off the other. But certainly a newborn, it needs you. It needs to be picked up and held tenderly and looked after. What happens at the birth? So generally your babies will be born, even your caesarean babies, some of you were talking about maybe having a caesarean, and some of you might have a planned caesarean, so we're all prepared for that, and sometimes we have an emergency caesarean. However, some of, you, some of you will just barely get to the ramp and the baby will be coming out before you can get here. Had a baby this morning born at home before the midwife got there, so it can be quick sometimes or it can be slow, we just, we just don't know. However, once the conditions are right, um, your baby is born healthily, we hope. The baby is dried off, and at some stage the cord is cut and clamped. We usually allow a few minutes for all that to happen. And then we put the baby, or we offer you to put the baby down your front. So the baby is naked, and it's lying on you directly, held like this. The baby's head is to one side, so the baby can breathe through its nose and its mouth. We may put a hat on the baby and we may lay you back a little to relax a little after the birth and we'll put uh, warm blankets, warm towels over the top. So we call this skin to skin contact and skin to skin is very important for the emotional side of things as I say and just calming uh, yourself and your baby after the birth process plus you're warming your baby and I defy you not to stroke your baby and say hello. Because if you're thinking, what is your baby looking like in the womb, when this baby's here looking at you, they can see what you look like too. And all that talking and nurturing and singing, you see, your baby can hear. Your baby can hear in your womb, clearly from sort of 30, 36 weeks or so. So the minute you start talking, oh, hello, lovely baby, welcoming your baby, the baby will look at you. You'll be, it'll be around your pinky finger, you'll be smitten. Because they always say, oh, other people's children don't do it for me. But the minute you get your own child, oh, they have that magic about them and you kind of fall in love, which is what we all want. So we want you to have this skin to skin, if you can, uninterrupted, ideally. So at least an hour or, so, or two. And this gives you that time to connect with one another, you know, count the cute little fingers and toes, check out the family nose. There's always a little blip on the ear or the toe or, oh, he's definitely got my, yeah. So you need to familiarize yourself with your baby and your baby with you. So this skin to skin is very important for regardless of method of feeding. This is just for, for connecting because this baby's been in the womb, cocooned for nine months and he's got to come out to the world and organize himself and orientate himself and work out what's what and who's who. Does that make sense? So don't be rushing off to the shower and cleaning yourself up, Mum. Just enjoy this hour or so. If you're not able to do it straight away because of perhaps an emergency, get prepared, Dad, you'll be next in line. So fathers do the skin contact too. But in, usually in the first hour or two from birth, it's often the mother, especially if you're thinking about breastfeeding because you can go ahead and feed and it all just sort of connects up and works. But if you're bottle feeding, we do the bottle feeding in skin contact. So ideally it's the mother that has this initial skin to skin. This is so good because it, um, as I say, it's important in the early stage for warmth 
and, and, and regulation of the baby's breathing and heart rate. Um, but equally, I don't want you to go away thinking it's just for that first hour or two after birth. We strongly promote skin to skin in the number of days, early days and first few weeks after the birth. We've even had grandmas doing skin to skin. It's important for that nurturing and the soothing and parenting. Because at the end of the day, you want to all be able to calm and um, look after your babies without too much stress. We've just recently had a kangaroo-a-thon. Did anybody know about that? You did, yes, we saw some posters. So we had a, a 24 hour kangaroo a thon, which meant we tried to count up our hours in a 24 hour period of who could do skin to skin for the longest. Um, so we had community, pictures sent in, all of it's important. And skin to skin in this sort of setup, do you see? The ideal is the mother is uh, laid back a little. Uh, the baby's head is here, the baby is prone on the mother, and certainly post-birth, if you're in this position, um, I don't know if you've seen the breast crawl video on UNICEF, but often a newborn baby, will, their instincts anyway, is to go forward. So they'll start commando crawling up the mother's uh, tummy, and the baby's got a terrific sense of smell, and so the baby will start licking its lips and getting quite animated and the baby can see, not, not in colours so much, but dark and light. So if the mother is thinking about breastfeeding, there's a dark area here around your nipple area called the areola. And so a clever baby will just crawl up, get more animated, literally lick his lips, hasn't quite got his knife and fork out at this stage, but he's really thinking, yeah, yeah, food would be nice. And he'll get quite animated and he'll bob across and some babies, healthy term babies, just latch on. They just know where to go and what to do. It's amazing. There's a scent from the nipple area and there's similar scent to the amniotic fluid, the fluid that they've just come out of. So often a baby, when they get hungry, will wriggle around and sometimes they start nibbling their fingers. But that sense of smell directs them upwards towards the breast. So that's rather nice. And after that first feed, they'll sleep and babies will sleep for quite a long time after the first feed. So what we're imagining is the birth happens. So say some of you will have a straightforward time, some of you have a cesarean, will help you with your birth. But in that first hour or so, enjoy the skin to skin and the first feed will happen as soon as the baby starts to get animated and think about food. So if you're breastfeeding, it's really easy because you just find the breast. And if you're bottle feeding, we'll bottle feed, we'll, we'll help you with that uh, and you can bottle feed in skin contact. Well, skin to skin contact certainly helps with your milk production if you are struggling. Um, and if you're thinking of breastfeeding, I mean, I would just wear my baby, really. I wouldn't have it away from me very much at all. I think you'll be very amazed at how strong that impulse is when your baby's born. You get very, very protective and you want to have your baby close to you all the time. It feels strange to be separated, and that's what's tricky, isn't it, when you've got a premature baby. However, going back to the first feed, so the baby is born. We all want them to have that first cry. That's very reassuring, because most parents will say, you know, what is it, is it all right? Uh, what does it weigh? Those are the questions we still ask. Even if you've had a scan and you already know the sex of your baby, it's kind of good to, good to check, isn't it? Make sure the scan was correct. Otherwise, you'd all be in trouble. Um, and then, as I say, let that baby have an hour or so. Let that baby instinct, instinctive behavior kick in. And then they'll feed. And they'll feed for a long time, usually. And then they have a good sleep. And then, then you're into it. Then that's it. That's what they do all the time. They feed and sleep all the time. Um, how, how do you know that your baby's hungry? What would make you think, hmm, you look hungry? What do babies do generally, do you think? Cry, yeah. Everybody agree with that? Anybody know of anything else? Fussing, yeah, fidgety. Yeah, they find their fingers, don't they? So before they cry, anything else? You're right, fidgety, fussy. Anybody know? Go on, you nearly did it. You do something with your mouth then. <laughs> what do you think? Maybe, yeah, what happens when we go in, we're, we're food shopping and um, I don't know, they've made fresh bread. What makes you go to the bread counter, even if you haven't got it on your list? You smell, 
Uh, what have your mum's made your favourite Sunday dinner? You're turning up and you're desperate to stick your finger in and she says, no, you have to wait. But what do you do when you see the food that you're really looking forward to? Salivate and go on, lick your lips. So your newborn baby will do exactly that. They're sort of, oh, thanks, mum. I'm hungry. Well, it's not quite as much as that. But they first of all watch closely. They first of all use their tongue. So they do cry, you're right, and some babies will go straight from calm to crying because they're really impatient and really hungry. But watch your baby closely and they are, they build up. So they're early, early feeding cues. They poke their tongue out and then they'll start to mouth. We call it rooting. So they start to move their mouth from side to side. They've been in the womb for nine months. So they're generally very squished in still. So their the hair, they're all kind of fetal, very kind of tiny line here. So the hands are generally here. So they get more and more fussy. And they might start nibbling on their fingers or their hands. That's, I'm peckish now, mum. Please notice me. Maybe little kissy noises. Much more animated. And they get really fidgety. And then they might do a few murmurs, like, where's my food? And then they'll start stomping their feet. And stomping their feet means, wah, you've missed my early cues. Now I'm really hungry. Or hangry, somebody said the other day to me. So they're hungry and angry. I want you to come across the thought today that you're going to notice your baby and you're going to notice the early, early feeding signals. Because if I'm learning how to breastfeed or I'm learning how to bottle feed, who wants to feed a screamer? It's quite tense making actually. You'll find it grandma. I mean, I'm old myself now. I haven't quite got grandchildren yet, but, but hearing the babies on the wards Oh, still sends a flutter inside me. Go, you've got to rescue. Cry means really help me. You've missed the moment. And you may need to soothe your baby before you get on and feed. So absolutely learn one thing from this session is that we want you to feed on the early signals. Yeah? You don't want the stress. You're growing your babies very well now. Look at you all, beautifully pregnant. And when that baby's born, your body is geared to breastfeed. Your body as a woman is geared to breastfeed. So the milk will be there. There can be challenges. You were mentioning about the cesarean, you mentioned about separation with the preterm baby. Don't get me wrong, there are challenges. But we can help you and care plan for you to overcome those challenges. We'll talk about some challenges in a minute. But that's what you're naturally geared to do. I think a lot of women worry about, particularly breastfeeding they worry about, will they have enough milk? How will I know that my baby's getting enough? And, Naturally enough, those are the questions we think, we think about. And in the UK, of course, we have, we have an alternative. You can give your babies formula milk. And um, if you do do that, if you're choosing to formula feed, uh, now this trust from April, we've made a new rule that if you're choosing to formula feed, then you need to bring your formula feed in with you from the get-go. We used to provide it all for all mothers and babies. But now, if that's what your choice is from the beginning, then please bring in the starter, it's called first milk, newborn milk. You bring in some little starter pack, or you can bring in a slightly larger 200 ml first milk and then we can decant it for you. Does that make sense? If you're starting to breastfeed and uh, you have challenges, and if we need to supplement with some formula, we, we'll provide that for you. We haven't run out of formula, but we're just not providing it in the same way as we did before. People say, can I breastfeed, can I bottle feed? What's best, what can I do? Well, this is obviously just a small graph of what's in both milks. So the formula milk, basically both have got fats and water and carbs and vitamins. And the breast milk is on this side. The breast milk is a unique milk because it's coming from your milk sacs and your own blood supply. The clever thing about breast milk is that it's um, protective. It has unique features in it that helps sustain your baby and grow your baby, but equally protect your baby from infections at the same time. And the very first milk is called colostrum milk. And that is rich in antibodies, immunoglobulins, and these are properties in the milk that basically give your baby its sort of first immunization, if you get me. Colostrum milk is a thicker, gloopier substance. It's um, like treacle, like honey. So it's got very low volume, but it's really, really enriched in the protection. And 
and that is essential to your baby in the first 24, 40 hours because the baby's not really immune to much. So to protect your babies against infection, at the very least, give colostrum. And obviously breast milk goes on and on and it has anti-inflammatory features, um, sugars, white cells, so it goes on. So the longer you breastfeed, the more protection for the baby. Women who breastfeed, well, they've looked at studies and research papers have shown that the more months, shall we say years, that you breastfeed, you yourself are protected from certain cancers, breast and ovarian cancer, um, type 2 diabetes from being overweight, um, the brittle bone disease, osteoporosis, just from feeding. And then babies, there's a whole host of um, protection against these infections. The most uh, information is about gastroenteritis. So it's, I rather put it the other way around. So by not breastfeeding, your baby's more at risk of, of these infections. Um, and so when people say to me, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Can I do both? It's your baby. Uh, you can feed your baby how you wish. But we would naturally, we will promote breast milk and breast milk giving uh, because it's healthier milk for you and your baby. And if that's important to you, then, you know, exclusive breast milk, for, especially for the first six months, is really key for the development of your baby, for your health and your baby's health. Because the longer you feed, the longer protection. And it's lifelong, absolutely lifelong. People worry about which type and what have you. There's a cost to all of these things. Uh, so if you're you know, worried about finances, then just go for the cheaper brand because basically they're all pretty much the same. And um, some of the cheaper supermarkets are offering cheaper brands, even from the traditional brands that we know in the UK. They're pretty much the same. They've all got to follow the EU standards of what's in them. You need to make sure that it says first milk or number one milk, it might say on the tub, or newborn milk. And that milk is perfectly fine for your baby, for your baby's whole first year. So first milk, first year. You don't need to switch to follow-on milk or hungry baby milk or nighttime milk or toddler milk or growing up milk. After the first year, your baby can have full fat milk just that you can get from the supermarket. In fact, there's less sugar in it than there is some of the brands here. They'll have something called toddler milk or growing up milk. There's way too much sugar in it, and sugar's the big no-no at the moment. So after a year, your baby, regardless of breast or bottle, can go on to full-fat milk. Does that make sense? And if you do uh, want to use that from the beginning, as I say, bring it in with you, a little starter, ready-mixed starter pack. We will show you how to make it up, because in the longer term, if you're going to formula feeds, it's expensive getting the ready-mixed ready, ready mixed stuff. It's easy and quick for the first 24 hours or so whether you're in hospital or if you're going to mum's for the day. Um, but if you're going to use it longer term, you'll get it usually cheaper uh, in a tub version and that powder has to be mixed and made obviously into liquid for the baby. And there's a bit of a um, sort of skill to that. So we'll show you that on the postnatal wards afterwards. So what's recommended? Well, what's recommended is breast milk. Um, and when your baby gets to around six months, and it's again, it's a developmental stage. So the baby that's six months can sit up unaided. The baby around six months can have all this cognitive skill, can sort of spy that bit of broccoli on your dinner plate, do this pincer movement, go grab it, bring it to its mouth, and can sit up unaided. And that's around six months. So when your baby can do these skills, then you need to give your baby supplementary food. So breakfast, lunch and tea. But you can carry on breastfeeding if you're breastfeeding for as long as you like. Some people feed for a year or two. So it depends on work, doesn't it? It depends what's going on. It depends if they're premature or not. It depends on your supply or not. But that's generally the rule. Some of us do have challenges. You know, we might have the preterm baby that's separated from us or we could have a difficult delivery. So we feel a bit challenged ourselves. So I'm going to talk about colostrum uh, a little bit more detail in a moment. And uh, some women are preparing in advance and harvesting their colostrum in advance of the birth. So you're already ahead of 
the game, as it were. We'll talk about that in a moment. I'm just going to switch to the to the knitted breast now. And colostrum is in your body. It prepares in your body from about 16, 20 weeks. So if you did have a premature baby, your body has got the first milk ready, just in case. And some of you have been finding, I suspect your breasts have been tender or they change, don't they, in pregnancy? And they often will grow. And some women, the first sign of pregnancy is that they're around the nipple area, the breast area is quite tender. Then, what happens with this colostrum? As I say, it's small volumes intentionally. It's, it's thick and gloopy. And I don't know how this will show on the camera, but we can do this later. Your baby has got a very small tummy anyway. So this is a small marble is sort of day naught. First 24 hours, I've got a tiny tummy. By day three, four, I've got my tummy is expandable. By seven to 10, ping pong ball size. So the baby grows and its stomach capacity grows quite quickly. But in the first day, I need a little and often, thank you. And your breast milk, after the colostrum phase, starts to come in from about day three, day four. Do you remember any of you had a baby before? So you get quite full and you can get uh, quite tight in the breast as your breast milk comes. Breast milk is a whiter milk. It's much more fluid. So colostrum is thick, gloopy, honey-like, little blobs at first, and mature milk is whiter. And your colostrum and breast milk, they overlap a little. There's a transition milk. And usually by a fortnight or so, your colostrum's finished with and you've got just mature milk. So it's a supply and demand. The more stimulus, the more breastfeeding I do, the more milk I'll produce. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how we do the expressing because what's important is that you know how to manage your breasts. So I'm actually on a, I'm actually on the hospital Facebook page. I don't know if you've been into it already, the maternity Facebook page, and I'm showing uh, about how to express. Some of you know about that, yeah? Because I'm on there again. Yeah. Yes, you recognize me, very famous. I'm going to be even more famous when I'm on this webinar. We'll cut that bit. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, give you the information, of course. And I think the most important thing is to know how to manage your breasts. So if you were thinking of massaging first, that can help. So um, just sort of kind of trigger off the hormones. Because what you're trying to do is trigger off the oxytocin hormone that releases the milk. So a lot of women will, will do a little bit of touching or, or sometimes just a light stroking around the breast. If you think about your breast as a sort of clock, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 and 3, I usually say to women, look, just, just start there, just start at 6 o'clock. Massaging quite deeply and then come all the way around. Keep going and then finish there. You might need to do that a few times. And make a C shape with your finger and thumb, come opposite. So come to the base of your nipple and then just widen out your fingers two, to two, two and a half, three centimeters back from the base of the nipple. Usually it's around the edge of that dark ring, the areola, not always. Depends on the size of us and our breasts, we're all different. And you literally just press and hold and release. Press and hold and release. You need to get a bit of a rhythm going. And what helps, if that isn't easy, I'll just go on the side here, what helps is if you just tuck back first. So just press back first and press and hold and release. And it comes, just the milk just comes. Especially with a larger breast, you need to come tucking in to hit the milk sacs because they're often a bit deeper. And if you do this for five, 10 minutes, you'll get milk. It'll just, at first, if you're doing it in pregnancy, certainly, we haven't even had the baby yet, you'll get little glistens, little, just a little shiny glisten. Then you'll get a bit of a blob. And then we'll give you, if you're collecting it for cesarean or what have you, collect in a little pot. And you just collect your blobs, scoop it into the pot. Yeah, keep going. And off you go. And you've got both breasts, so use both. You put your lid on your pot. And if you're doing this, in the pregnancy, you freeze the pot, the whole pot. And then if you do a little more each evening, some people do it once a day, some people do it twice a day, you can just express it off into an egg cup or a, or a teaspoon or something at home and then just take your pot out of the freezer, take the lid off, pop a bit more in, put the lid back on and keep it frozen. So women are coming in with their cesareans, ready all planned or what have you, with, I don't know, 10 mils or so of colostrum, already done. 
we keep it frozen uh, and then we put it into our freezer upstairs. So tell the midwife you've brought some in in advance. And then if you need it, if there are some early challenges with your feeding, then we can defrost it quickly and give it to the baby. So we've always recommended harvesting the colostrum for the higher risk pregnancies. So the women who are diabetic, the women who we know the baby might go to special baby care, be separated, um, that sort of thing, the elective cesarean mother. And now I'm trying to say to women, anybody could do this. You could just do a little at home, get five or 10 mils. Challenges last time, you mentioned about milk supply last time, maybe get ahead. So think of yourself like a girl guide or a boy scout, be prepared. And actually the colostrum harvesting is really going down well. It's not for everybody, I admit, but it's going down really well with the mothers that are doing it. Especially with your first, you don't know if you might have challenges. You don't know what the birth will be. Um, and we're finding that there are compromised mothers and you've got pain or cesarean or what have you. And uh, you're trying to get your act together and what have you, or the baby's separated from you. We can draw on this milk already. It buys time and just takes the pressure off. And also women who know how to express and they're towards the end of their pregnancy, we just say, well, carry on. You've, still, you've obviously got some challenges and they know how to do it and you're away. And your mature milk comes in that little bit earlier. Instead of day three, four, five, the mature milk is coming in at day two, three, which makes a huge difference to yourselves and the well-being of your babies. If you're interested, um, we suggest you do it from 36 weeks, yeah? So don't want to do it too early. 36 weeks onwards. And um, I've got some leaflets here and um, you can collect one at the end or if I haven't got enough, they're on our website and I'll direct you to that um, at the end. And coming back to the expressing, it's really, really useful to know how to manage your breast. Because when the milk does come in, three, four, five, six, what have you, you know, you go from sort of, you know, a, a B cup to a double D overnight. Uh, you can feel a bit tight. Uh, we call it engorged. Suddenly the milk whooshes in and they can be a little bit tight. And if you're trying to breastfeed and things are a little bit challenging, if you know how to express, you can soften this area up. The baby comes on, latches on nicely and drains the breast for you. Equally, a few weeks down the road, sometimes you can wake up and you've slept a little longer or the baby slept a little longer and you can develop a blockage, a little block duct. And maybe that goes to mastitis, which makes you feel shivery and a bit flu-like. So you can self-manage your breast. If you know how to do it, you can put a hot flannel on there, massage the area that's a bit stubborn, go towards the nipple, feed your baby, and express off after a feed so you can clear the block duct and maybe prevent the mastitis coming. It's really useful to know how to express. People worry, will it put them into labour? Sometimes I'm asked that question. If I'm stimulating the breast and the oxytocin hormone, will it trigger my labour? Unlikely, we've not had any yet. So if you're sitting here overcooked, when you're in the induction suite and they're giving you the propest to get the baby out, to get your labour going, you'll be expressing the way, I'm sure. So you might want that to happen if you're 41 weeks overcooked. But yeah, we say 36 just to be cautious. I have made arrangements, we've had twin mothers who start at 34, only because they're likely to have their babies by 36. So I think if you want to start before 36 weeks, then speak to your midwife or your consultant here, because if you're having a medical birth or one of the consultants you're under, it's best to talk to them. And if you've got problems with your cervix, if you've had a real preterm baby, you mentioned 10 weeks preterm. But if you're sort of 22, 24, 26, we don't recommend. But we're saying start at 36, so if you got to that far, you're doing pretty well. It's not for everybody, and some of you will be listening to me with your noses quelled up and thinking, that's not for me. So we're not saying do it, I'm just trying to make a suggestion. It's very difficult to know how much you'll get but anything is good. And we've got little tiny one mil syringes, two mil syringes, some people come in with that, or dad sent home to go and get it. So the other day we had a mother who had forceps birth, and then the baby got quite jaundiced, and the baby was just slightly skewed, couldn't quite organize his mouth and tongue, a bit bruised from his birth, and um, wasn't really attaching well in the first day or so. And um, suddenly the mother said, ah, I've got that clostrum. 
father raced home, got his seven mils from the freezer. So the baby had that the first day, perfect. And you got on and expressed. And by day three, the baby was on the breast quite happily, but it took the baby a little while just to, you know, organize the jaw and the sort of let the bruising come out and then settle again. So she was so glad she did it. And funny enough, I remembered her from the class such as this. And she screwed her nose up at me in the class. But she thought about it later. And, uh, and then she did do some. And actually it came in really handy. And yet I've had women with, you know, 20, 40 mils in the freezer and they've gone home and they've left it in our freezer. Hang on, don't forget your colostrum because they haven't needed it. So I think, I think I'd rather you did have a go at the colostrum harvesting than brought in formula just in case, you know. <laughs> it depends on how you want to feed your babies, but it's far better to give them your milk if there's challenges and try and avoid, what we're trying to do is avoid formula supplements where we can. All women have colostrum, really, they do. I think women think they don't, but they do. And I think if you're trying to get it afterwards, it's a question of technique. So that might mean that somebody else just needs to go through your technique with you. Maybe you need to tuck in a little bit further before you press. Uh, maybe you need to come slightly wider, or maybe you need to come slightly closer to the nipple area. Yeah, sometimes it's worth just stopping a minute and massaging for another few minutes. It's tricky when your baby's separated from you sometimes because normally we have our babies near us. So, you know, maybe get the baby or go to see your baby and go do some kin contact before you start. Maybe do the uh, expressing beside the baby. And I often find touching the baby, smelling your baby. I think smelling the baby's head, oh, it's just a wonderful smell. And that triggers off the hormone. Because you, what you're trying to do is trigger the hormone to release the milk. Yes, you're having to press, but once you've got the hormone behind you, it's like a force of nature. You need a bucket, never mind a one mil syringe, because it flows, just flows easily. So it's creating the conditions to be comfortable with uh, doing the expressing. We're talking about colostrum harvesting, that's for the pregnancy, that'll freeze. But after the baby, your breast milk will store. I mean, it'll sit on the coffee table for six hours, you, when you put it in the fridge, it'll last five days and it'll freeze for six months. So it's a really flexible milk. So how do I know what's going on at the actual feed? So when your baby first suckles, we're talking earlier about those signals. So you, how do you know the baby's hungry? Because it sort of starts to get animated, a bit fidgety, fussy, yeah? What are we like when we're thirsty? If you were, if you were, I suspect some of you are thirsty, if you were to take a drink now on a hot day, do you drink quickly or do you drink slowly? Quickly. So what do you think a hungry baby does? Yeah, it suckles really quickly. So what happens when the first baby first goes on, and we'll talk about the latch in a moment, the baby goes on, suckles really rapidly. Suckle, 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 really rapidly. Big fat cheeks. Suckle, 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 suckle. Swallow. Suckle, 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 maybe eight, 10, 12, so quick little suckles, <coughs> swallow. And then the miracle happens. All that fast stimulation, your body then triggers off the hormone release. So your body feels stimulated. The message goes from your breast to your brain, back to your breast, aha, we need to produce the milk. Oxytocin kicks in, and then you get what's called the letdown. Some women feel it as a tingling. First time mothers, don't worry if you don't feel any tingling, but second, third time mothers, you sort of, sort of feel, oh yeah, there's a bit of a tingle. And the, you know what's happening because the milk is gushing out of you and the baby changes gear to slow that flow down. So from rapid suckles with a swallow at the end, he suddenly goes <coughs> sort of suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, breathe. Gum, gum, gum. Um, 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 um. At, the, at the pace that the milk flows. So he gets this sort of tsunami of milk. And then, ooh, I'm full of now. So his behavior becomes more content. He's less animated, less fussy, less agitated, because I'm getting a full tummy. That's rather good. So he pauses for longer. And he's still there, firmly attached on but he hasn't come off because he hasn't quite finished. So he sort of had his starter. 
He's had his mane and he's thinking, hmm, do I fancy a bit of custard? Shall I have that pudding? So he does, goes into what we call a little light flutter sucking. So he's paused for quite a long time, does a tiny little shudder, tiny little flicker, um, 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 and goes again. So he's really getting his pudding now. And then he'll go again. And if he's really hungry, like sometimes we are, we've wandered all again, he'll stimulate again and go into quite fast suckles again and then get another letdown and another letdown and another letdown. Babies can get several letdowns on the same sort of innings. And your job, if you're breastfeeding, is to look at the rate and the rhythm. Notice the little suckling pattern, big fat cheeks. And when you can hear it, it's more like that. It's like swallowing saliva. You'll hear a little, it's quite quiet swallow. It's not as gum, gum, gum like I did it just now. It's just sort of get you, get you going. But tune in to your baby and you'll be able to hear that swallowing. And that's very reassuring. And then they just go, oh, I've had enough now. And they spit the nipple out. <sighs> they look like they've had Christmas dinner. They're all full, all content. And then they wake up and open an eye and go, actually, I did, I did want to come back. I want secondsies, thirdsies. So depending on the appetite of the baby and the day and the time, a bit like us, we can get away with a, a cup of tea and a biscuit sometimes to get us through to lunch. And then we want a bit of a lunch, don't we? So we all have different appetites and so does your baby. But the suckling pattern tells you quite a lot. Because if your baby stays on rapid sucks and never seems to get into the active suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, breathe. He's only on long, long, you know, quick, 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 quick suckles. Maybe he isn't activating the high milk. Maybe he's not quite getting enough. And he'll also be agitated and fussy still if he hasn't drained the breast properly. And something must have been happening with you last time. Maybe the cesarean or the circumstances around your birth. Maybe the baby didn't activate enough on the breast. It can affect your supply and we don't want that. So another way of seeing the feeding behavior at the breast is one thing and then if it goes in girls it's got to come out so the baby's poo in the nappy in the first few days changes color it tells you that everything is going well so what's in your baby's gut now nice little thought though it is is that meconium so the baby's drinking the amniotic fluid there's cells in there there's hair all sorts that builds up to the the first poo if you like we call it meconium and it's black and green and tarry. What you're after is day sort of five or before is this mustard poo. You need at least two of those two pound coin size poos per 24 hours. And if it's all going in the top end, it's all going to come out the bottom end. So if your baby isn't getting enough to go in, the first thing you'll notice is the poo. It'll slow down or it won't move through the colours. And equally, when we know enough is going in, there's plenty of wet, heavy nappies. So at first, day naught, day one, one, one wee. Uh, day two, day three, three wees, you know, minimum. And by day five and six, you should have five or six heavy, wet nappies every 24 hours. So if you're not getting the heavy, wet nappies, if you're not getting a change in poo, something isn't right. So that probably means that not enough is going in. For some reason, there's a challenge for something. And ultimately, what will happen is the baby's weight might be slow to regain. So a baby like this, be three and a half kilos, say, most babies are back to birth weight by a fortnight. Some are back by three weeks. If you've got a baby that's, say, still down by 10% at three weeks, hopefully you'll have been to see me or you'll have come to somebody to watch your feed. Because, as I say, most are back by three weeks. If you've still got weight challenges with your baby, then you probably do need to see somebody to look at your feeding and talk you through what's going on. And probably the first thing we'll do is observe the feed and just make some adjustments to your latch and your technique. That might be all that's needed, a few little tweaks. And sometimes we'll say, no, come on, let's get that pump out. Let's start expressing. Let's supplement the baby with some express breast milk until we can get you back on track. How often do you feed your baby then? How do you know? How many feeds in 24 hours? That's the right answers whenever he needs it. So those signals we talked about, the early feeding cues, you need to look at your baby. This is why you need your baby with you all the time. You need your baby close to you or you know, in the crib beside your bed at night. If you're downstairs, the baby needs to be right near you 
you need to observe what your baby needs and then respond to it and feed. So you were saying every two to three hours, wouldn't it be lovely if you could set your clock like that? <laughs> you poor babies don't quite work like that, I'm afraid. We call it responsive feeding, so you respond to the signals, which might mean a sort of what I call a cluster feed, yeah? So we snack all the time. Anybody do that? Like what I say I do, I'm on a holiday, uh, or, or in the evenings when I'm watching you know, Netflix or something, uh, I'll just keep grazing. And babies often do that in the evenings particularly. She might have four feeds in two hours because that's what the baby wants. And then he'll settle and then he may wake and then have another spurt of feeding. So it isn't every two to three hours, I'm afraid. Wouldn't it be lovely if it was? It does get like that. You do eventually get, get into a pattern. But at the beginning, I'm afraid it's responsive feeding, which means it's kind of on the signals. And it's much better to go on the early signals. So he's not a rod for your own back. It's not, oh, he needs feeding again. It's, oh, OK, you need more now. It's our mindset, I sometimes think, in the West. We feel, oh, you're fed, you go down. You're fed, you go down. That's a little old-fashioned now. Actually, what we do now is meet the needs of the baby. The baby then develops very nicely. If I've got a need, my parents have met my need. And actually, let alone just feeding your baby, it's really good for the baby's brain not to have to cry too much. Does that make sense? Because my baby's needs are being met, I'm fulfilling the needs, it's a win-win. And babies who feel emotionally responded to actually grow up to be much more healthier, uh, confident ch children. Because the world's a safe place, I've needed something, mom or grandma or dad, they've met my needs. It gives you a little confidence, I'm loved, I'm wanted, I'm cherished. I've never had to ask for anything because my parents are there. You actually grow up feeling a lot more happy about the world. Holding your baby for feeding, that's what this next little bit's about. So I use a CHIN acronym. So the C means close. You can't feed your baby a mile away. You really, really need your baby in close. So holding your baby such that your baby can hug you, wrapping around the breast is good. Because remember they've been fetal, they're curled in, so the hands are often here. So gently undo the arms and bring your baby this close. And most mothers just want to pop them on, don't they? So hold the baby across. And in real life, the head, the H is for the head. So the head needs to be free enough to just to tip back. If you're, who's got the water? If you've got your water, you need to take your swig of water and just tip your head back. So the baby's head needs to be here over your wrist. And the eye is in line. So that means the baby's head and its neck, and shoulders and hips are in line. So that's in line. It doesn't mean a straight line across, it just means in line. This is in line, up. This is in line, if you had a cesarean, this is quite useful, under the arm. See, that way. So in line is though I'm not twisted. So what I don't want to see is the baby being held in the crook of your arm with its sort of chin down and looking at the ceiling and then its body is one way and its head is twisted the other. You see, that's not really efficient for the baby or you. So in line is the baby facing his food. Does that make sense? With your hand here in the baby's shoulders with the head over your wrist. It's hugging me, head's tipping back, he's in a straight-ish line, and his head is tipped back over my wrist. And the good old N is nose to nipple. Your nipple needs to start somewhere here, just above the top lip that baby can smell you and move upwards. Babies, remember, come up. You need the baby to have this wide mouth in a minute. So if I've got a breast such as this, a little well-behaved one that just sits here, <laughs> that's easy, isn't it? Just baby opens his mouth and in I go on that shoulder. If I've got a larger breast, then I might need to support my breast a little. And I'll show you those techniques in a minute. So close, head tipping back, in line, nose to nipple, baby opens his mouth, tees the nipple, is sensed over, over the top lip. Remember the baby's hungry, you've picked him up because he's giving you those signals. He's agitated, he's moving his head around, opening his mouth, licking his lips, poking his tongue out, saying, feed me. So you pick up your baby, get him nice and close. And I think the other thing is to, if you can, just maybe cross your leg over, let the baby sit on your, on your thigh, 
so that the baby's here. I think a lot of first-time mothers have their babies too far over, and they certainly have their babies too high. So just the baby comes up from underneath. So what happens when the baby's really ready, he brings his tongue down and forward, and he tips his head back. He's making space. The newborn baby is kind of crunched in somewhat, huh? Because he's come out of the womb, so he's, got all, he's all sort of tongue and no chin. Uh, and so he needs to make that space. So if he senses the nipple is here, he'll bring his tongue down and forward, and he'll tip his head back, and, and then there's some space for your nipple to go to, into. The bottom lip is well away from the base of the nipple. You won't see this when it's your own breast, because you're looking down. But his chin touches the breast first. So it's the chin that comes into the underside of the breast. Does that make sense? So here. So when my baby's on, I can see some of my areola along the top, and I can feel my baby's chin working the breast underneath. And if anything, I tuck into the underneath shoulder. And remember to bring your own shoulders down. And so the baby is breastfeeding, not nipple feeding. The baby just sits on the nipple, it's gonna hurt. It won't be comfortable. You have to really move baby to the quick, quickly onto the breast. So as he opens his mouth, brings that tongue down, ah, that wide part, he should already be on the breast. If you wait for him to open wide, and then he comes to the breast, he's going to close down. And you need him to lead with his chin. Another mistake a lot of mothers make is they sort of face plant the baby. The whole face goes into the breast. You're in so enthusiastic, the baby on quickly, the whole face goes in his dinner. He pull backs to breathe, and he'll slip onto your nipple and hurt you. So that can be some of the perils of breastfeeding, people say, ah, oh, my nipples are sore, crack nipples, whatever. That's because they're on the nipple, not the breast. So plan B, what if I've got a larger breast? What if I've had a cesarean? What if I, my baby doesn't just jump on the breast? Plan B is us guiding the baby. I tend to reach round. This is awkward for you. You probably won't like this, but I want you to think about how this feels. Making a C shape, reaching round. This time, I'm going to come sideways. So this time you, you support your breast. Put your thumb here on the edge of the areola. But your underneath fingers aren't up here. You're not crowding the nipple, do you see? My underneath fingers are here near my ribs. Raise my elbow a little because I'm a bit short. Put my thumb there and almost make a dent. So that you can see my nipple's already going high. Because what you're going to do is guide the baby on. So the baby is close, he's wrapped around you. You've got your hand making that cradle, because a lot of you will worry that the head is going to wobble off. So I've made a C-shape, and the nape of the neck is resting in this little shape I've made. Do you see? I've actually got quite a firm grip on my baby. And my baby's in line, and there's my nose to nipple. So I'm now teasing the nipple over the top lip. Baby's hungry. So he opens his mouth, so I bring him on. But look what I do here. I just... I just guide that nipple in. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm in charge of this now. Tease, 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 and you literally guide it in. Don't let go. Wait, wait, wait. Suckle, 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 suckle. Um. Swallow. Suckle, 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 suckle. Um. Swallow. Does that feel okay? You're probably having to do the guiding on because it's been a little bit tender or something's already not gone quite right. So make sure you feel it pulling and drawing on you. Lean back a little, take your hand away, and then put your hands around and get yourself cosy. So guiding on is pretty important uh, to know if you're already having challenges. I can guide on in lots of different ways. I've had a cesarean. I don't particularly want the baby across my cesarean wound. And I can do it this way. Tease, tease, tease. Bring the baby on and guide it in. And you've got great eye contact. The underarm rugby ball position, we call it, is, is, is a nice one. I can do it here in this laid back position. I can sit up a little guide the nipple in, put my hands underneath, and lean back. And we'll show you, we'll show you these things. But it's very easy, very nice. Be careful if you do reach round. A lot of women who reach round, this is where the face planting comes in, they sneak a finger or two onto the baby's head. And you're guiding on like this, do you see? So you're going, Kunk. and so you've got the nose in and not the chin. <laughs> And then the poor old baby can't breathe, and so we're clever, aren't we? So we sometimes put a finger there so the baby can breathe. But can you see the whole angle is wrong? It's nose leading, not chin. And you really need to be chin leading. 
in the shoulders. The trouble is with breastfeeding, you can't know this until you do it. It's something you can't easily just practice on a friend's baby, can you? <laughs> or a dolly. <laughs> Work out what's best for you because it's your reach, it's your tummy, it's your breast. You were used to tiny, tiny baby last time. Tiny babies do well in that upright position because moving forward and moving up is a very instinctive way. And although we say, oh, try the underarm position for uh, a cesarean, it is good for cesarean, but it's really, really easy just as a start position. They cling on, don't they? If you think about animals do, they cling on. And piglets, always got to mention piglets, sorry about this, piglets come up every time. But piglets, kittens, puppies, they feed like this, don't they? They come and they feed like that. That's just what a newborn baby is geared to do. He knows what to do. So play, just take a dolly or a teddy. Often people bring one to the class, but it's okay. Have a little play before you uh, have your own babies. But even if you're thinking of expressing, you're gonna probably want to wash and rinse everything. So wash everything with really hot, warm, soapy water, rinse it all, and then sterilize your pump set and what have you, uh, your bottle making equipment between batches. How do you sterilize anything? Boiling water. Boiling water. Yeah, heat. So good old fashioned 10 minutes, boil something, it's sterile. You were talking about if I did some antenatal expressing, do I need to sterilize my pot or my teaspoon or my egg cup? Yeah, you could boil it up for 10 minutes. It's done then, isn't it? Just something really, really clean. Cold water is what I used to use in my day. You just got a big ice cream Tupperware or some such, fill it full of water and you put a sterilizing tablet or some sterilizing liquid need to change that every 24 hours. It's like a bleach. You're basically getting rid of any bugs. And if you do sterilize using that method, when you take out your pump or your bottle and bits and pieces, take it out, shake it out upside down. And I always rinse it round with some cobalt water from the, from the kettle because otherwise you've got a little bit of bleach in the bottom. And I don't think that's very nice for the baby. So swill it round and just tip it out and let it all drain. And then a lot of people buy some sort of steam method. So you can get electric, steam sterilizers or you can use your microwave your steam sterilizing so that means you've got your equipment in a, in a tub a tub aware or in hospital you'll see we use these big plastic bags you put a measure of water and then you put your microwave on for three minutes or whatever the the wattage is or your steam sterilizer it's electric version click on the button it steams it in about probably eight minutes or so yeah so it's it's very very clean so not just, not just the dishwasher, as it were. Does that make sense? And you do that for about six months. You'll find by six months, the baby's everywhere. They're, they may be crawling by then, or certainly if they're not, everything is the very oral babies. That's how they learn. And so you'll think, oh, well, I won't bother sterilizing after six months because, you know, the dog's licking its face one minute and they're rolling on the carpet the next. And it's normal life, isn't it? And in fact, they say it's better uh, to allow the, well, you know, the animals, the, the family life, it's far healthier for the child to build up its immunity. So if you've still got your babies in your arms, um, I'm going to use a bottle. So guess what? You hold your baby really, really close. You've got your baby close. What you want is good eye contact, don't you? And for safety, you want to enjoy the baby and you also don't want to choke the baby or make sure baby doesn't take the milk too quickly. So I've got my um, bottle of breast milk or my bottle of formula in here. And how do I get the baby to open his mouth? Just tease, yeah. So tease the teat across the top lip. The baby says, yes, I'm hungry. He lowers his tongue down and you put your teat into the roof of the mouth. The key thing is not to have the baby flat with a bottle like that. You drown the baby. So you need the baby just to pace the feed. It's called paste feeding. So actually hold the bottle as straight as you possibly can. As the volume goes down, there'll be a little tip to the bottle, obviously, because you want milk in the teat area, not half milk, half air. At the breast, the baby would suckle, 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 swallow, pause. So when you see the baby pausing, just lower the bottle. Suckle, 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 pause. Suckle, 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 suckle. You just take your time, pause. You just don't want it to be too rushed. Um, and you certainly don't want your baby getting overloaded and overwhelmed with the milk. Sometimes the baby will want a longer pause and he'll push out the teat um, or, or, or start to choke a little. If, he's, if he starts to do that, obviously, take the bottle out. Give the baby a, a, a breather. Maybe sit your baby up slightly. Give him a chance to win. So I've done now C-shape 
under his chin and I'm just patting, I don't know, we always pat. I don't know why you pat. You don't need to pat, but we always do. We kind of pat. Most commonly, parents will, will wind their babies like this up over their shoulder, head to one side, and dig around a bit. So just give yourself and the baby a little rest. And he's still wanting more. Well, who knows? Let's see if you do. And you just tease the teat again over the top lip, and in you go again. Because you might have, I don't know, 60 mils in the bottle, doesn't mean the baby will take all 60. The baby will feed responsively. Sometimes, wolf down the 60, as if to say, and more. And sometimes it's 45, 20. It just depends on the appetite of the baby. Once your baby is regularly taking down the volume that you've prepared, and kind of looking for more, then you make up 90. And then see what the baby does with it. But there's none of this finishing the whole thing before you, before you do. It's all on the pace of the baby, do you see? So you responsively bottle feed, as you would if you were on the breast. You don't want to force feed the baby, and you don't want the baby to be overfed. If you've made up formula, then once it's made up from that powder and the hot water and everything, you've got to really use it within two hours. You can't keep it around for later. And then somebody's mentioning the ready-made. If you've brought your starter pack in, uh, or you're using some of the starter pack, the little ready-made at home, we say in hospital, um, once, it, once the baby's had its food, then discard after one hour. Probably what's sensible in the newborn is to take your starter pack, which has probably got about 80 mils in there, and just undo the lid and just decant what you need. I mean, a day naught baby, do you remember the tiny tummies? I would give sort of 10, 15 mils, no much, much more than that. Depends on the size of the baby. Three kilo baby, 10, 15 mils per feed in that first day or so. You don't want to overdo it. So you'll get several goes out of your little starter bottle if you decant it. We can show you all of that. Uh, we'll show you what to do upstairs. Yeah, those little starter bottles and you can get starter cartons and things like that. They, they last about 24 hours, I think, in the fridge. What about sleep then? You've got the baby. What position does a baby go in to for sleep? How do you lie your baby down to rest? On their back. Yeah. Yeah, well, they can rest with you if you're with them. Absolutely. They love that position. They love to be nurtured and cuddled. But you're going to put your baby in its own crib or in its own cot on its back. Yeah. So I think everybody got that message, haven't they? Back to sleep. Yeah, good. That's for safety as well. So if they're with you, they can be resting here. Um, but they're better, obviously, if you're separating for night, they're better off in their own place, in their own cot. And you put the cot right up next to your bed so you can reach over and feel your baby and get your baby straight away if they start crying. If you're lying with your baby and you're resting up, then you need to be awake. So the definite no-nos are lying, falling asleep on the sofa with your baby. That's not good. We do have had, sadly, some sofa deaths in the UK because the baby comes from the parent to the side of the sofa and suffocates. Um, and obviously, the safest thing is to put your baby in its own crib next to you. And we suggest you do that for at least uh, the first, certainly the first six months, if not a year. Because you're trying to reduce the incident of sudden infant feed, you know, sudden infant death. So back to sleep, safely beside you in its own crib. And you will, of course, bring your baby in at night, etc., to feed your baby. So then you need to go right on your side if you're lying down to feed. Draw your knees up, the baby's on its side, and post cesarean, post whatever. We can show you this in hospital. So your baby again comes up to feed, yeah? But your crib is right by your bed, so the baby doesn't have a worry about falling out of bed. Yeah? So think about now, think about your bedroom, how where's the baby going to sleep, where are you going to put the cot, do I need to rearrange the room, think about where everybody's going to go. Maybe doing some batch cooking, simple meals in the freezer, think ahead. Yeah, and think who can be your family support. I think you need it emotionally as well as the physical tiredness. So suddenly you're going to be from a couple to a family unit, it's lovely, but it's not without its challenges. So just to summarise then, connecting with your baby is important for your baby and your own emotional health. I think it's important that you realise about the movements, and you clearly are this afternoon, and then 
you know, talk to your baby, sing to your baby, connect with your baby now. If you respond well now, it's easy to respond once the baby is born. The skin to skin, that first hour or two, perfect. If you can't achieve that, this is what the partners are for or grandma, because sometimes we worry if we have a medical emergency, obviously that can be a delay. But get the skin to skin as soon as you're both able and then don't have it interrupted then. So these things are achievable. Um, if they have got emergencies, as I say, we can, we can manage it differently. And then obviously recognising how the feeding is going well. I think a simple rule of thumb, what goes in has to come out. <laughs> and if you remember that, you won't go too far wrong. And soreness isn't normal. Soreness isn't normal. Don't let anybody tell you that it is. And you know now, you can either let your babies just jump on the breast or you can guide your babies on and we can again obviously run through this with you. We need to see you feeding. And certainly there'll be a lot of feeding. Minimum eight times in 24. How many feeds is very hard. That's a minimum I'd say for purely, purely breastfeeding. The baby friendly website is, is, is the, is the go-to place. And um, there are little videos within that on getting to know your baby, building a relationship with your baby, skin to skin, the first contact, how to breastfeed, how to bottle feed. It's all on there. So that's a really good site to start with. And it's nearly four o'clock. So I'm done. So good luck, everybody. It's lovely to meet you all. I'm sorry about the background noise. And I'm sorry that you had to go through me being filmed because that's all is a little bit strange. I'm sure you're all on your best behavior. Have you turned it off now? Ha, ha, ha.